Welcome to the Rebel Love Show. We are a once a week broadcast from Manchester, New Hampshire, where we are pro pot, pro gun, and pro coffee. And pro moonshine. And pro moonshine. And uh, you can find all of our content via Voluntary Virtues, J Rev Radio, also iTunes, Stitcher, and go check out our YouTube channel. I am Rob Mathias. I am Joel Valenzuela. And I am Shire Dude. And our today's guest is none other than the one and only Mark Warden. Bum. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with you it's in awesome. a secret and also with you. of your studio. <laughs> in a secret location somewhere in the heart of Manchester, New Hampshire. Anyways, we have a bunch of announcements, but I think Joel should take the, uh, take the first one here. Yeah, so I'm leaving. All right, there we go. That <laughs> that is uh, that that's that announcement. He's done after tonight. So uh, last show, as an official part of the staff, I'm getting demoted to beg. Please, can I be on that show? I used to run. And so if I want to be on again, I have to beg now. I can't just be like I'm showing up, even though I kind of live here. Pretty sad. That's why I'm drinking. There you go. Well, you will be missed. So it was a pleasure <laughs> with you being on the show. All right. Uh, well, that was. A sh- I thought you were going to do like a, a couple of minutes. You love talking about yourself. No, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not until the end. Okay. That's at the end. I already right. claimed. The I know you claim. I know you I claim the, the you claim the end. But I I thought you were going to do a little bit more. All right. So we have a bunch of announcements. Uh, everyone here at this table is going to be participating at Keenvention. Jazz hands. So uh, uh, I'll consider I'm, I'm talking right now. I'll go first. I suppose. Go first, uh, please. I'm going to be on the direct action panel with uh, Garrett as moderator on Sunday, and then I'm also going to be moderating a uh, independence panel right before that on Sunday, uh, which I'm crazy excited for because I love New Hampshire independence. Uh, but uh, look for that if you're going to if you're in uh, near New Hampshire, you want to go to see what the activists are like here in New Hampshire. Go, go to Keenvention, go check it out. Um, but uh, Joel, what, what are you doing, Keenvention? I'm going to be going to the dance party. Oh, who, I'm loving the dance party. But in, as far as professionally, um, I'm going to be on the new mover panel with Shire, dude. And <laughs> it just doesn't roll off the tongue. I, Andrew. I think that's at uh, 4 on Friday, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. I, I don't know what time it is. Which I'll, is I'll usually know. when activists wake up on a Friday. So. Dude, yeah, that's pretty today much, uh, for me, just saying. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm also going to be on the Cop Block ch- panel again. Mark Warden represent cop block hoodie. Woo-hoo. There you go. Talking about a kinder, gentler kind of cop blocking. Well, how gentle to, can I get with cop blocking? I don't know. Might have to break out the feather. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Oh yeah, like Ian Freeman's microphone on the top of his camcorder is all feathery. It is all. Have feathery. you seen it? Yeah, yeah. I want one of those. You what? just tickle cops, walk up and yeah, just like them and tickle right under the nose or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what are you doing at uh, what are you doing at convention? I'll be involved in a legislative panel of Keith and uh, who else? And uh, Marav are going to be co co panelists with me. Basically, we're going to be talking about some of the challenges and successes we've had legislatively and politically here in the Shire, in the free state of New Hampshire. Talk about some of the um, successes we've had legislatively and some of the challenges and uh, what it looks like going forward in the future politically, at least for those of us who are still left inside the system here in New Hampshire. Yeah. Work that system. Just blow it up on the way out. Sounds right. I'll light a fuse on the way in and <laughs> run out on the way out. And also, uh, one last announcement. Uh, we are, well, I don't know about the other people at this table, but I'm going to be uh, trying to get together a bunch of activists for a uh, planned New Hampshire Independence Outreach in Keene on October 18th. There's a huge pumpkin festival. Uh, I want to get a bunch of people together uh, to hand out some New, Ham- uh, New Hampshire Independence uh, literature because you know you're going to have thousands of people from around the state go to where the people are, and that's where exactly where they are. They are in uh, they are in uh, you know the pumpkin festival because that's one of the biggest festivals of New Hampshire. Am I wrong? Is no. that, uh, is it just me, or do you say the Bumpkin Festival? <laughs> Pumpkin. No, it's something Pumpkin. like 10,000 10, jack-o'-lanterns there. Yeah, no, it's a, I'm going to be wow. on scene with uh, my colleague, Ian the Marshal. Marshall. We are going to be conducting air support. Oh, yeah, in case it, in case the state has some sort of snipers. Yeah, the, Ian, the prophet Ian, peace be upon him. Maybe you One could have a, a requested. drone. Give a drone that drops feathers on the snipers. Yeah, kinder, <laughs> gentler. No, you should get the drone that drop cop lock lit on the snipers that are up there. Yeah, that'd yeah be... because seriously, pumpkin festival and the police had snipers last time. What the hell? 
Yeah. Well, I thought this was America. <laughs> you know. Hey, by the way, for our um, millions of listeners out there, can you remind them when millions. Keenvention is and how how to give them more information on that? Keenvention is October thirty first through the second. It's in uh, I forget what hotel it is, but somewhere in Keen. Uh, Keenvention info is the website. Uh, Go there. Go buy a ticket in Bitcoin. Support uh, not using the Federal Reserve note and go go buy some Amen, tickets. Brother. Yeah, forget the forget the paper, forget the paper. It's the one time and place when it's okay to go full keen. It's always okay to go. Well, <laughs> 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 you're right. Well, that and Pork Fest are two acceptable locations it's to go full. It's a keen. different level of Pork Fest. That's full Pork Fest. Yeah, that's true. You can't. I mean, so you can get outdone by people at Pork Fest from being full keen. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so uh, Mark, uh, you are the quote unquote, well, former quote unquote anarchist state rep. <laughs> um, what bring? What brought you to the Shire? Like, why? Why are you here? What happened uh, back in Vegas? Why'd you come? Well, first of all, it sounds like a contradiction in terms to be an anarchist state legislator, but you know, I'm trying to blur the lines there as best I can. Uh, trying to be one of the most libertarian oriented legislators in the entire country. But that's part of the mission. I moved here from Las Vegas, Nevada in 2007, um, inspired by the Free State Project. Came to New Hampshire knowing this was the last best chance of liberty in our lifetime and perhaps the only bastion left uh, to really show what smaller government and bigger personal liberty looks like. So we're, I'm working with you guys you know, every day in our own way to try to make this the um, example for the other 49 states on what liberty looks like. and how it can work for people. What, how did you discover uh, the Free State Project? Gosh, as I mentioned earlier, offline, before um, Facebook, people used to be on the, the chat lines and the forums. <laughs> and people would, I heard about it originally from the Libertarian Party a newsletter. They, there was an advertisement in there about Free State Project. Checked it out um, in the just early stages of the Internet, and then there were these forums. We could go on and find out more about it. And I actually signed up early when they got to choose the state. So the origins of Free State Project was the idea was to choose a small, low-population state where um, 20,000 movers would make a real difference. So we got to vote among the 10 smallest states, population-wise, and New Hampshire came out on top. So who did you, What state did you vote for? I voted for New Hampshire. Thank okay. you. This was uh, the voting message called Condorcet's message, uh, method, where you could vote for – it's kind of like um, – like a top three type thing? Top, top, yeah, so vote your top three. So I would vote for New Hampshire, then Wyoming, and then I think uh, North Dakota. Now, if Wyoming had taken the top spot, would you have moved? Yes. But I, I told I, you at the I, time, if it had been Alaska, I would not have moved. It's like the same thing for me, kind of. Now, what is your mover number? 491. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> Outclassed me by hundreds. Triple digits. Wow. Wow. Are you are you gonna are you gonna do like uh, Joel here and get a tattoo of of it on your Sweet. arm? Sweet, I like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, not for everyone. So uh, why? So you kind of talked about it earlier, but why do you you uh, you take pride in being self proclaimed uh, anarchist state rep? Like, did you get like uh, heat in the state house for? going you know li- literally branding yourself as a volunteer and anarchist in the state house like how did like your colleagues there like you know relate to you yeah i did not brand myself as an anarchist legislator or even an anarchist i might tell people i believe in the ideas of voluntarism but nobody there knows what that is <laughs> most people there really don't even know what a libertarian is so i come off as a very libertarian leaning republican or libertarian type of legislator I was elected as a Republican. I'm part of the Republican Party. Here in New Hampshire, many Republicans are quite liberty-oriented and libertarian-leaning, so it's not that much of a stretch. But you know, a lot of the older people in the party think it just means that I want to legalize pot. Well, that's true. Yeah. There's, there's more to it than that. Yeah. No, I, I, want to le- I want to legalize, legalize everything. No, I, I know I've heard a lot from Greg Moore about your early days in the State House, and he seems to have taken certain pride in forming a new, more effective legislature. I don't know if that's just in his all his own head or if you'd concur. No, Greg was great. He was very helpful in the early days. Just give me a sense of uh, what would pass, how to be effective, really. You can't just go off there with a macho libertarian flash and just try to tell everybody how smart you are and that your ideas are better. Because the fact is our, our ideas are better, but the world isn't ready for them. So you have 
to, in order to be effective, you have to make cogent arguments. You have to go with a little bite-sized incremental approach to improvement. And that's, uh, I've, I learned that quickly. You can't just go for it all. I did sponsor a bill to remove cannabis entirely from the criminal code. So that was awesome. That was a pure bill. Uh, other bills were out there to pass medical marijuana or to decriminalize or to you know, just make it a, a violation of offense. But I said, let's strike it entirely from the code. And I thought that was a good approach. Um, it didn't pass the House, but you know, at least we had our day to, to speak about it, and it opened the eyes of some people. It was amazing. Like, right before I moved, I saw how the State House, at least the well, State House part, um, passed the, uh, the um, legalization of pot. And it was kind of crazy because I had, like, majority Republican support. And it's always kind of like, in New Hampshire, politics don't, it's not normal politics in New Hampshire. And, like, the Republicans in the State House want full-on legalization of pot. Well, not all of them, obviously, but there's enough support where it was a majority of the, you know, that, that, that wing got it through. And then the Democrat governor, there, she was the one that uh, wanted to veto that, and it never got through the Senate. So it's very fascinating, like, the politics of, like, New Hampshire is just yeah. insane as it is. Well, yeah, one thing I've learned from knocking on th- probably thousands of doors, asking people their opinions, is... The rules in other states don't really apply. People, you'll have conservative Democrats, liberal Republicans, and almost right. everyone wants to call themselves an independent no matter how lockstep they vote. And that's the nice thing about New Hampshire is there is a streak of independent thought, at least self-proclaimed. So only 30% are registered Republicans, 30% are Democrats, and 40% are independents. So they make up the majority of those who actually vote. And those who don't vote or don't register are likely independent as well. How long have you been a... Uh libertarian since 1995 like so in my mid-30s i think when i discovered the libertarian party and it was like the uh, i went to one of their meetings and the light bulb went off eureka i said wow that's me i thought it was the only one that thought that way there are plenty of people out there was that was that like your um was that your, like your uh, red pill moment where like you know going to that or like what kind of woke you up to the ideas of liberty for me i started out as a single issue guy and it was taxes because my whole life, my former career, is I'd been a W-2 employee, salary, weekly paycheck, and I moved to Nevada and got in real estate and became what's called an gen- um, independent contractor, where I'd get full pay, in this case commissions, uh, without anything taken out, right? No taxes were with, uh, withheld. So on April 15th the next year, I had to write one big fat check to the federal government. And bam, that's what got me thinking. So, oh, my God, where does all this money go? How, I know I don't get this kind of services or programs or any benefits from the federal government, and I don't want to give them any more of my money. What the hell is going on? And that's really what got me uh, going down this rabbit hole, learning more about libertarianism, about libertarian thought, about uh, true limited government, and about where your money is, uh, is going and how it's wasted. So it's been a 19-year journey for you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I, I'm thrilled to see young guys like you, like people in this room. It's awesome. Some, uh, some people weren't even alive when you made that switch. I know. Isn't it amazing? You guys get it. You guys are way more libertarian yeah, than I am. But I, the next step. I got to say. I'm, I'm I, still blossoming. Some of the young people, I mean, younger than even people at this table, came at the right moment when it's like there's something happening. There must have been some lonely ass years in there. <laughs> Especially, really bad. especially living here in the early days. For if you're an early mover, I mean, we're so, everyone here at this table is an early mover, obviously. Right. But like now you and the five or whatever, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's got to been lonely. There's thousands of us here. Yeah, I mean, like it had to be like a very different. Like going to meetups where there's like ten, twenty people, or you know, that was yeah. like everyone in like Manchester when there was just you know twenty people. But now it's like. There's meetups all the time. I can't keep track of every single person that's here. I don't know every free stater. You it's know unbelievable. And every night of the week, there's something. Back in Nevada, I went to, let's say, the annual Libertarian Party convention for the state state convention. I'm sorry. And there were like 30 people there. Oh, <laughs> we, get, we get more than that on a Wednesday night for beer night yeah. here yeah. in Manchester in a city of 110,000. It's really exactly. unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, m- mind you, like, that doesn't seem like a lot, like 30 or 40 people. But in a small city, that's a lot. That's a huge amount of people. Like I remember going to uh, Ron Paul meetups back in uh, 2011 and whatnot uh, in Chicago. It's like an area of like eight million people, and we'd get like five, 
maybe eight. You know, it's like one, like literally one person per uh, million people showed up for like an hour or so, and that's pretty much it. You know, here, like like you said, there's literally everything. Something's going on every day. Like I can't go to every single event that is going on. You know, whether it's activism or just like social events, like I can never keep up with how many events. Like my uh, case in point, you're talking about uh, Tap Room Tuesday. This last Tap Room Tuesday was my first Tap Room Tuesday. Right. I've been I, I've been here since January, and that was the first time I was actually able to go to that. Yeah, like I I know that was like a long like, back in the day. That was the only thing going on once a week. Was the only time you got to see other free staters was Tap Room Tuesdays. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because just going around living and stuff, you just run into random porcupines that no one knew existed. It's like. You know, it's like a like stumbling on buried treasure or something. It's like, oh, there's another one. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you'll see a bumpy bumper sticker yeah, or a little yeah. porcupine All bag. All the time. There. I walked yeah. into, into Starbucks the other day, and oh, my God, it was unbelievable. There was a, a porcupine behind the counter as a barista. <laughs> I was blown away. <laughs> I, wonder who, I wonder who that <laughs> might <Go> be. Figure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I love, like, walking down Elm. Like, every time I go downtown to uh, Manchester, I always run into some sort of porcupine at yeah. some point, like, walking around. Or the bumper stickers, like you're talking about, like, you, we, we mark our cars. That's a, that's a thing. Like, we, we, we mark our cars. You know who, you know, either uh, there's a bunch of bumper stickers or they're rocking Wisconsin plates. Ah. But, like, you know, you know they're a, they're a free stater if they have one of those on there. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know, I, know, I know what you're about. Right. When I, when I drove up tonight to come to the studio here. I, it was kind of dark outside, so I couldn't see the addresses. But I saw a car parked up front, and the license plate says Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's my uh, international sign of like that's where I'm living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Andres's free talk live sticker. Yeah, yeah. My car is all marked up on the back too. Just one. The, yeah. Just no, one? it's it's got the free talk live, and it's got a free state project. Oh, oh. I see, that. I wouldn't put the Free State Project one on there. Well, gotta, you know what I do. That was before I came over here. Oh, so yeah. it's 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 a um, it's grandfathered into the relationship of moving here, huh? Yeah. The okay. one thing that I do have is I have this bumper sticker that says "Live Free or Spaz" with this goofy looking cartoon <laughs> porcupine. Yeah. The other day when I was doing laundry, some lady asked to take a picture of that because her cat's name was Spaz. <laughs> and she thought that was just so awesome. It's like live free or die, but live free in my cat. Oh I've my had gosh. people. I've had people drive up behind me and take pictures while I'm, of my plate while I'm driving. Happened to me in Bedford yeah. the other day. Yeah, and it's just like okay. Like I, I remember I was sitting in a parking lot, like on my lunch break, and like guy came out and like, oh, can I can I take a picture of your plates? Like my son would be would freak out at it. I'm like, uh, <laughs> sure. Speaking of license plates. Can we go back to legislation just for a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love, of course, I love of legislation. Course. I really don't like ahead. talking about politics that much, but this is one of just the shining examples of the way we're making a difference in New Hampshire. And particularly for your listeners outside of the state, uh, they'll be amazed. Or poor, really, poor bastards. Yeah, just get here as fast as you can. Yeah. You'll be <laughs> amazed. Please, 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 they're please, really please. having successes. This year, like uh, every year, the cops want to allow uh, these automated license plate readers in New Hampshire. Basically, so they can write more tickets, right? We're the only state in the union that prohibits them by statute. And so we're trying to keep it that way. So this bill to allow them came to my committee that I sat on, and I just fought it all the time. I went and sat in the car, the police car, to watch this thing work. And it was like a five, between a 5 and 10% error rate of misreading the plates. Because if a plate is bent or you catch it in the wrong light. Or it says Bitcoin. Or it says Bitcoin, but... Of course, the cops like these things, and you know, we had to fight how long they could keep the, the data and re- record the data and you know, how when they'd have to toss it out. Anyway, unfortunately, it passed the committee, got passed out of the committee, came to the House floor, and another free stater on the Democrat side and I on the Republican side got up, and we overturned the committee recommendation and killed the bill. Well, who, who is, <laughs> is can awesome. you name names? Was is he out in clarity? No, it was one of the other, it was one of the other two. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I don't I don't have them memorized, so that's fine. His, his name is very similar to yours. His first name is very similar to yours. All right. I don't even know all the the free staters no are clue. in in the uh, state house. To be perfectly oh, okay. honest. Oh, okay. Okay. I think I know. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of uh, state house politics, like the primary just happened recently, so there's a lot of free staters running for office. Again, I don't want to I don't want you to out. Uh, most people of that them, aren't out already. Most of them seem to pass their primaries. I heard that yeah. 247 <laughs> passed their primaries. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully at least 200 of those will actually win. Uh, but uh, what, what uh, um, number of do you think would really actually uh, get elected in November? Um, where, where do you see that going? He's not going to give an actual number. 
that is right because we are being monitored on this very show by NSA and others. <laughs> and others. <laughs> and others. So, others. Uh, the history is that in 2006 was the first free state elected to the House, the state house. We got from went from one to four to 14 to 11. And Aww. But this year, I, I think it's going to go up to about 16, between 16 and 20. Ah, there are yes. about 30 free staters in the general election in, on November 4th. And I'm expecting at least half, probably two-thirds of those to win. That's amazing. I mean, that's we're. I mean, mind you, I'm I'm putting my minarchist cap on for a second because you know I don't I don't, I don't like voting and politics and all that jazz. But in New voting Hampshire, is force. yeah, it's, voting is voting violence. violence, man. Voting is violence. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, where do libertarians actually you know get elected? You know, and that's that happen that happens all the time here, and it's amazing to see like these people go into uh, office, like you know, like how are you talking about like different bills and stuff like that? My thing is. Because for me, I feel like most free staters are on that philosophical same position that, you know, all of us at this table are, mm -hmm. where I almost will sacrifice my principle and I will, like, vote in this upcoming election because um, th there's free staters running. So I'll vote for a free state. Everyone else, I'm not going to I'm not going to vote. I'll just put none of the above or something along those lines. Right in Ron Paul. <laughs> right in Ron Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or Berman Supreme. Oh, yeah. yeah. Berman yeah. Supreme. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but... Uh, it's amazing, like just because all these people have the same philosophical view that we all have. You know, it's not like you know these other type of libertarians that are like are very restored republic and they're, they're very minarchist and you know they they think cops. They're you know some li small conservatives are very pro cop or whatnot. None of these people are like that. They're very pro liberty on across the board. Um, and if they can just go in there and just put a monkey wrench into like bills coming through. I'm okay with that. Yeah, because you know? like as far as principles, I mean, no one, no one is pure. Everyone pays taxes. Everyone drives on the roads. Everyone obeys. Everyone's like, traffic a, laws everyone's to a little. Degree. Everyone's a little bit statist. Yeah. It, well, no. It just this is the world we live in. We live in a world that's not the world that we want to live in, and it, we're not guilty for living in this world. We were born. I mean, who wasn't born here, right? And so, I don't. I mean, the big theater that is politics. It. As crazy as it is, if I can use it to diminish the size and scope of that theater, then so be it. That's great. I don't care. Yeah, it's political jujitsu using their force against themselves. Well, let's yeah. give it a try. There are many paths to liberty, whether you're a voluntarist or an anarchist or minarchist or a libertarian yeah. or a small government guy or a constitutionalist or a uh, unicornian, whatever. Yeah. Let's, uh, one let's thing, give it a try. One thing that yeah. when I'm talking with people who are outside of the whole, they're just in a little bit more of a complacent part of their lives, and they're not quite full anarchist or crazy things like that. And they're like, well, you know. One thing I try to point out is whatever you're doing with your life, person, you just do more of that and less of this crazy circus around messing with stuff. It's not like, like once we – every victory that we do – Every victory that we achieve is just some area of our lives. We just get to go back to our normal lives and just forget all this stuff. Well, keep in mind that people have been brainwashed their entire life. And some people like nanny statism, right? They like the, na the big brother or the big mother of nanny They state. like being taken care of. Look what happened in Scotland. They just had this um, historic vote. It was they rigged. It where they rigged. could vote to secede <laughs> from Great Britain. They had a chance for independence. I know. And they voted no. I mean, that was a great example. But it wasn't a huge vote no, though. Like, it wasn't, like, overwhelming. Yeah, and it was, like, an unprecedented, huge generational change. Like, for example, when we talk about independence or secession votes mm -hmm. around here, it's, I mean, even if you get people on board with it, it's like you get scared. It's like, you know— Second guessing themselves at the altar or whatever, you right. know what I'm saying? Everyone does it. It's just a huge change. If people get cold feet, they're like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is huge. People are always afraid of the unknown, and oh, yeah. they're a little bit scared about that. Even in Massachusetts, about six years ago, there was a vote to cut the state income tax in half. I think it was from six. Who doesn't want that? I know, it, it failed. How is that possible? That means so many voters are public employees that. They all showed up to vote to keep the high tax to protect their own jobs. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that makes sense. For back to like the whole Scotland thing, like I love the fact that uh, that vote happened 
Not that I think that there needs to be a vote from the do that, but that was enough for a start. Though. Oh, it was a huge start. It, 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 it laid a uh, legitimacy on the table for Western uh, powers to, uh, you know, break apart, you know, with without violence taking place. Like, you know, England, uh, the UK could have came in and stopped the election and like prevented that from happening. They didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, they could. Yeah, they, they could have uh, th- over. You know, yeah, yeah. They probably fi- fixed uh, fixed the vote, but nonetheless, the vote happened. You know what I'm saying? Like it actually, there was a vote. Um, they allow people to have free speech and talk openly about secession um, in the, like you know the empire that is the UK. So like that, if that can happen there, why can't that happen here? Well, yeah. they're trying to do it next door in Vermont, aren't there? There's been oh, a, yeah. Long, oh, yeah, yeah. a long time Vermont secession. And we can't forget the Cascadians. Yes. The, um, Arcadians? Yeah. Or is Cascadians? The Cascadians in Oregon and Washington that just won out, too. And, of course, Texas is just bitching and moaning about it as, as usual. And they so far they haven't done squat. But if some other states secede before Texas, they're going to be... No, we gotta be next. We gotta be next. We gotta be next. We're gonna lose out on all that secession. They did something similar in Colorado this year. There was a vote oh, I think, yeah. for four counties or four towns in northeastern Colorado that one were thinking about seceding, and they put it to the vote. I think it was just a, uh, you know, it wasn't a binding vote. It's just sort of a to see what the people thought, but it also failed. Like, yeah, these people are so used to daddy just, government. Yeah, just like the split else. California into six pe- six yeah. pieces vote. Now, uh, all that failed just because, oh, my gosh, this is something I, that has never happened in hundreds of years. I don't know what to do with it. It's scary. But the fact that this happens underscores that big thing in people's minds that people want to live and die by their own decisions increasingly. They don't want to live for other people. They don't want to have other people take what what's theirs, decide things for them, and they just they feel helpless. They feel kind of like enslaved a little bit, and they want to take charge self-agency, you know, of their own life. I think you're always going to keep seeing secessionist movements uh, keep spreading and gaining popularity around the world and, and in this country as well. Uh, Vermont's definitely built up that culture. Like, I would love to see, you know, p- people here build up that culture more for New Hampshire independence. Um, but you definitely have that independent spirit in Texas, like the Cascadians and whatnot. Um, people in northern uh, California, southern Oregon, they want to do the whole Jefferson State or whatnot. I mean... Alaska. I know there's a separatist movement in Alaska. They already kind of are separated. I mean, no one goes there. Well, Joel yeah. brings up an important point that people real, really do want to be left alone for the most part. Yeah. But in the past, for the past millennia, there hasn't been really a good um, method to get that idea out. But now times are changing with podcasts, with the Internet. Now we can actually put uh, words and put a voice to that, I- that idea or that concept yeah. that people never had before. So now the really free, thro- free thought is going to compete against the big three uh, broadcasters or government, words, government support thanks, media. Thanks to the Rebel Love Show, the world will soon be free. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, look at the, like this studio right here. Like, the, like what we're doing right now probably would have cost – like 10, 10, 15 years ago, you would have had like an entire TV studio, to, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, a satellite on Blink and all that jazz, and all the equipment would have been crazy expensive. Yeah, now look at us, a couple of broke-ass immigrants that just sort of like moved in and just and scrapped together Scrapped some thing. microphones together at a table, put some foam up, and threw it up on the internet, now you know? thousands of people are here are, you know, unpolished voices and our ramblings and stuff. But this, this kind of thing, and I was in, uh, before I left Arizona, I helped. Uh, I was working at the Western Center for Journalism as their fundraising director, development director. But I was watching them as they were creating this like studio for professional broadcasts. And they were the my boss was all telling me, "Look at this. This is cool. We're doing it for one tenth the cost it cost like right. five years ago, and it was something that cost easily twenty or more times what this cost. And it just now being a voice to planet Mother fucking Earth is so easy." It's so easy, so cheap, anyone can do it. And so there's no restriction on voice now that, oh, well, we have to pre-approve it through all this kind of stuff. Anyone can talk to the world, and now it's the strength of the message that rises to the top, not the strength of the polish and the money and the equipment. Yeah, anyone can talk to the Internet and at large. And most people, like especially younger generations, like I mean, like for me and like a lot of people younger, they don't really watch much TV anymore. It's everything's on the Internet, you know, and th- podcasts, YouTube – you name it, that's becoming more of the um, 
the medium in which communications are done, and you're talking about like technology coming up higher or whatnot, information can be exchanged so quickly now compared to just you know a decade ago, where you know like we all carry around these smartphones that like like instant communications between everyone. You know, I, I actually to be on the show literally from my smartphone. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like I didn't have to like write you a letter and like, you know, call you from a land I go to a landline and actually you know call up your office or phone or anything yeah, like that. The best example of that that I could think of from my personal experience is uh about the whole secession topic. So earlier in the year on July fourth I organized a uh, an independence rally in four different um cities around New Hampshire. So we hit you know, Keene, Nashua, Manchester, and Portsmouth, and so set the groundwork for that. And so Derek J. Freeman of Victimless Crime, Green Legend, had a piece of news now. He wanted me on to talk about that stuff, but I wasn't able because I was at, like, a Bitcoin meetup and stuff. So I did my call-in just from my smartphone. I'm there just chilling, eating, you know, well, what, what was it, chicken wings with everyone else. And I just, hang on, guys. I just go to the corner, pull out this little sucker right here, and then just broadcast to the world right, right from there. And anyone can do that, and that's just something that that technology can set us free. A lot of people are just, this is cool, this is fun, but they don't realize the earth-shattering consequences of just being able to do, have access to all of human information and technology right from this little thing here that we never you, have you, off uh, off our person, basically. You have Unless entire... Unless we drop it in the toilet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, besides besides you using it for uh, selfies and Snapchat left and right... Do do. I Snapchat too much. Oh, so do I. So I, I, I need help. That. If anyone here no, no, is you, a Snapchat counselor, please. You need you need, a, you need intervention. I, I I'm starting to snap you snapping because that's that's all I see you doing. Like you'll be in public, like snapping here, snapping there. But I mean, no, snapping not, conference call, snapping uh, anything, snapping ash. Like I'm tired of you snapping ash. You snap that's, ash way too much. She, like when she has no water, she's all bitching about well, it. Give her so. some water. Instead of, instead of giving her some water, you literally Snapchat a video for a while that worked. Look with like sad music playing in the back. Crowd, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's funner. At, at any rate, like besides you get for stupid purposes like Snapchat, like you do have the uh, entire world's uh, knowledge at the and tips of your fingers with a, a device that fits in your pocket. And just going serious for a second, I don't think even Snapchat is stupid. Maybe, oh most, no, I don't think it's stupid. Stuff, I don't think it's stupid. Most of the stuff I do on it might be stupid, but the fact is, it's instant communication with everyone with a very visual component. So that way. Myself, I can be connected to someone halfway across the world, and they can just be living their like they can just be acting as if they're my friend right next to me. They can see everything. I'm there. Look at my oh, drink this well, latte for work. Look, yeah. look at this dead possum here, whatever. And then just it's like they're hanging out with me, but they're not. They're halfway across the world, and it's really pretty. Well, cool. you're you're sharing moments of your life with another human being. And yeah. that's what you're using like Snapchat for. And I, I, I get that because I do the same thing. I share like moments I'm doing or whatnot uh, with other mostly people. Mostly e-cigs, like 98%. Yes, well, e-cigs. just like you do mostly do the ash or you do like uh, you, you got to take latte photos of yourself all, left and right. Yeah, Co- Coffee is God, okay? Well, just, I can't do, deal without it. I, I completely 100% agree with that. <laughs> so um, anyways, uh, you uh, – well, Shire, dude, you don't, you don't snap anymore, man. You got to get on the Snapchat with us. <laughs> I see – you see all my fucking yeah. snaps. You never <laughs> snap me back. Yeah, you never snap Fuck back you. anymore. I, I don't use Snapchat as a conversational thing. I use it as like a random moments of, of art, sporadic art. So. Do, you, do you download all the videos you take on that? Um. Usually, yeah. yeah. Well, what are you going to do with them? I don't know. You're like, about I, to I, see. I, I want to see as, mu- as much footage as I can have. I will have. I will take it. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I want a, a a montage of all your uh, <laughs> or, of all your Snapchat videos into some sort of Shire Dude uh, video. Uh, <laughs> but speaking, of, when is your, when is your Shire Dude video coming out? Your 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 that season finale. Ooh, yeah. Well, the le- the next three episodes are coming out all at the same time, um, and I don't want to put a date on it yet because I'm not close enough. Because he has a fear of commitment. Yes, it's a deep set fear of commitment. Well, commit to something, <laughs> man. I'm, I'm I'm jonesing. Like it's been like a month. I know. I know. Like you you're you're knocking them out left and right every weekly, week. You had, yeah. you had a weekly uh, release schedule. Now yeah. it's just it's. I'm well, I'm also waiting on on some stuff to come in the mail. So. What do you know? Well, without giving away too much. Fire dude flame. Okay. I remember um, uh, for the last video, you had me record something really ridiculous over Facebook chat, and I had no idea what you were going to use it for. It's like, can you just like make fun of a dog? It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty strange request. Don't, it was. I'm like, but that's not a strange request coming from you. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's a strange request. Now, for all the viewers at home, 
who have not seen Shire Dude, um, just look, watch that shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's bizarre, it's funny, it's it's a unique piece of art that's also an insight into the community like none none else. Yeah. I mean, we all talk about the work that we're doing or maybe take some – look at my coffee. Look at my flyers that I'm handing out. Look at this. And it's like that misses the whole like everyday life thing that somehow he manages to, co- to capture and make it batshit insane. It's a, so it look is... at Shire, du- Shire Dude. Also, whenever Shire Dude's creative potential is unfulfilled, someone will release – Anonymous sources. Someone will release a Shire douche episode to outdo him, and then that's how you know he has to step up his game. You're, uh, yeah, well, that, you're that welcome. Shire douche is releasing some killer content. I gotta say, it's only been one Shire douche though. Yeah, because he picked up his game again. If he, no, if he hasn't. He hasn't released another episode I know. since you. Since but if these, somebody, if put, these put that three, out. if these three episodes aren't killer, Shire douche me, whoever was gonna release another one of his. That's just how it works. Well, you you need to get on that uh, whole new episodes, man. I'm jonesing. You know, um, Dude, actually, stop saying jonesing. No one says that. I actually, actually I want to have a show where uh, we just pitch shows during the show. What do you think about that? Pitch shows during yeah, the show? Yeah, like, show, show pitching shows. I'd call it like showception. <laughs> showception. What do you think yeah. about that one? Actually, I no, but seriously, I do want to do a show where we. Uh, I've been I've been talking with a uh, special someone about doing a show where we is she hot? highlight a is it Lauren definitely where we highlight fox. a specific um, holy fox activist you and then we do is. like a kind of like a like a mini documentary you know each episode's a documentary of a specific activist it's still in the works though I don't want to re- reveal it's too gonna much. be like it's gonna be like a we, one thing that'd be cool to do like a uh, a profile like some crazy trippy profile mm-hmm. of each activist in the Shire yeah we'd have to start with like Mark Warden yeah. For, yeah. sure, for sure. How, how trippy would you make Mark Warden's uh, profile video? I don't know. Mark Warden, what do you do besides real estate and politics? Nothing else. That's I, it. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I do for fun that's not uh, liberty movement oriented is play volleyball. Oh, that's cool. Oh. That's cool. There we go. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sand volleyball during the summer and then indoors during the winter. Well, what are you going to do now that you're no longer a state rep? I'm looking forward to finding out. Well, I like keep traveling. And I remember you at the big gay dance party up in Porkfest with oh, your yes. flame and sunglasses and everything. It was awesome. So I expect you to top yourself over at the Derek J's. At Derek J's party, yeah. And convention. Oh, yeah. Made that sort of fun. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm definitely I, looking I've forward to the I've bounced around the, the idea party. of going there dressed as Derek J. <laughs> We'll see. No, I honestly, you've talked about it enough. I'm sold on it. You, if you don't like, I'm gonna be disappointed. Like, that's the best thing you could do is go as Derek J. Hopefully, he's not listening to this, which I don't think he is. But it, um, no, if well, it's my, it's my last <laughs> show. He might. He, you know, he might listen party. to it. I'm gonna show up the party with a roll of quarters in my pocket, <laughs> and he say, "You uh, happy to see me, or are you just going to do some?" Um, <laughs> like Robin Hood. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's got to be a roll. It, it needs to be a, uh, a roll junkie. of nickels. Don't they use nickels? Since, yeah. I don't know what they use. Typically Dude, nickels, the yeah. I'm not, I'm not the Keniac here. If anyone's a Keniac here, it's Shire Dude. Probably. Yeah, you're, you're, you're the Keniac. Isn't it funny how the term Keniac has become kind of a, a slur? I think that you can use any. I love the Keniacs. Well, they, I love them too. Well, they've taken it back, so it's not a slur. Yeah, it was like Porch Monkey. They call yeah, like Porch Monkey. We've taken it back. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, what about Manchkin? What if that? I hate Manchkin. No. By the way, I I I, I, don't I refuse know. to take that back. I, I don't want it. They YouTube, can have it. Manchkin like, how, how you've been here longer than any of us? Like, why did they start doing Manchkin? Did the, the Keniacs start that? Did Manchester well, activists start that? I've never heard the term that? You've I never heard about it. Good. I've heard of Manch Vegas. Yes. Well, yeah, that's you, a local. Was that yours, though? Did you make that because you're from Las Vegas and now you're in Manchester? No, Manch no, Vegas? no. Oh, no. I got here, though. I guess no, no, in no. the olden days, there used to be some backroom gambling going on and slot machines. Well, there's a club called Manch Vegas right down yeah. here on Granite. Yeah, it's a it's a local. See, that's another thing that's crazy. Cause I always listen to, like, what people are doing in regards to, um, uh, like, you know, listening to, like, me and me and Shire Dude here. We spent, uh, I, how many years did you listen to LRN before you moved? Ooh. That's a really good question. Uh, I probably started sometime in late 2012. Okay, yeah. I mean, I spent at least a year to two years listening to LRN, and like they would talk about like you know that and like friending people on Facebook, and you'd see like these you know, these terms, these words that we use in regards to about the community. And I always thought that Manch Vegas 
was a free stater yeah. term for Manchester. I just assumed it was because so many people used it. And uh, I remember I was uh, at my day job. I was doing interviews, and this local just, like, started talking about Manch Vegas. Like, you know, I used to live down in Manch Vegas and stuff like that. I'm like, wait, wait, Manch Vegas? It's like, oh, Manchester. Yeah, you know? every place has its own nickname. Like, you know, Manch Vegas, you got Trashwa, you got Screw Market. <laughs> you know, I could go on, but I won't. Yeah, well, I, I just didn't know that. I, I, I assume that was. Now, a, Milford is its own nickname. It's the proper name and the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it, it, I, I, have you had success in Milford from uh, Tinder? I did once go to, the one time I actually went to Milford proper, I went with the MILF. So, just well, saying. <laughs> Anyways, back to like actual conversation stuff. We was, I guess I tracked you. Um, New Hampshire independence, Mark. Where where do you stand on New Hampshire independence? It's great. What is it? What is it? It yeah. it means that we are going to get rid of eighty to ninety percent of the tyranny in our life by leaving the union. Yes, I'm all for it. Then you're all where for it. Where do I sign up? Uh, you can sign. Uh, there's no sign. We don't want state project yeah. dot org. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> there's not an official position of the free state project luckily well, no one in this damn room is an official representative or they could be in a hot fucking well water. that actually I have a, a, a thing about that did you guys all read jason soren's op-ed piece in the washington post yes. about secession he like walked right up to the line of talking about yeah, how the fsp and, was a secessionist movement and i remember in the fsp doers group they were debating whether or not to share this article of the FSP thing, and I shared it too early, and then Keith Michael or Keith Carlson bitched me out about it. That was pretty funny. <laughs> uh, he, do, he, uh, he, he will do that. But. Yeah, he's a little bit sensitive. My first interaction with the guy was him bitching me out over something like that, and then later I met him and, and started working with him, and he's a cool guy. Well, as the only official politician here in the room, I guess the only one that still believes in that crap, um, my Do you believe in it or approach, just engage in it? A little bit of both, but probably the latter. Mm -hmm. But my official response would be I'd, re I'd like to first try this whole idea of um, nullification. Right? Tom Woods talks a lot about that. Where we He's a great anarchist, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> where we exercise the 14th Amendment and, and state sovereignty and start pushing back against some of these ridiculous mandates that come down from, from Washington, D.C. So... Yeah, well, the idea of secession is fine and dandy. And until then, it's sort of a halfway stop. Let's start just rejecting all these federal mandates, start uh, exercising our sovereignty and doing our own thing here in New Hampshire without yeah. Big Brother telling us every – Now, I, I find the nullification argument really kind of fascinating because, of course, the federal government's never going to recognize nullification efforts. But uh, as part of my master's program, I go went through a considerable amount of international law which the difference between normal law, as you would say, is it's law between equals. So there's no top-down authority saying you all have to do this kind of thing. So what happens is eventually there's a de jure law and de facto law, right? There's de jure, which is on the books. This is the law on the books, and de facto, this is how it really is. And you can make the case for if a law has been de facto some way for long enough, then it's de jure. So, for example, the... 420 protest that uh, Rich Paul, you know. Which we were all at. Well, no, Shire Dude hadn't moved there yet. Are you yeah. talking about the, the rally on well, the, All of them. All, all of them, them. They did. Okay. At first, they were arresting because they were smoking marijuana on the steps of the state house, and they were getting arrested and eventually stopped getting arrested. Now the cops don't even show up. People, sh I mean, I'm, I'm preaching the choir. You know what I'm talking about. You show up there, you can smoke marijuana on the steps of the state house, the center of New Hampshire's government. And it's illegal, but no one does anything about it because they just got tired of arresting activists for just, you know, smoking a plant. And one could pro possibly make the legal argument that it is de facto legal, hmm. that eventually, you know, if someone gets arrested for smoking, mar just smoking marijuana, then they could have a there, – there could be a possible legal argument for, well, even though it's on the books – illegal it hasn't been enforced openly at all in such a long time that you guys got no case to prosecute this guy let him go well yeah i can see it definitely becoming a point where uh like so many people smoke pot at this point that 
it, I mean, cops smoke pot. I'm sure there's a lot of cops on the force that smoke pot as well. And I mean, it's going to get to a point where, like, especially it, ones who have to deal with free staters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't feel sorry for them, by the way. I I, I enjoy giving cops a hard time. I think you, know, you should some, invite some police officers to come sit in on this show. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I would do that in a heartbeat. In fact, there's there I've heard rumor of a few that love what porcupines are doing. There's one guy in particular who everyone on the force of Manch PD just gives them shit and they call him the Free Stater cop. Ah, you're the Free Stater cop. Ah, fuck you. Because apparently he's so... He's like, oh, I like these guys are doing. They're fighting for our rights. Same as I, I swore an oath to uphold the Constitution and awesome. they're kind of doing the same thing and then he gets shit for other people on the force because of that. But if I can find who that guy is, I'm going to invite him on the show. Be like, dude, you got to come over here. You nice. know, we promise we won't film you all the time. Other than these <laughs> webcams, all, these webcams all around the room. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So, uh, Mark, where do you see uh, for the next couple of years with the state house, with uh, all the porcupines that might make it? Will probably will get into the state house. Where do you see like any kind of legislation people should be aware, like you know, like anticipating? What do you anticipate in general for like you know, liberty activism in the state house? Because the state house rep, I mean, you only make a hundred bucks a year. So it's it's pretty much you know volunteer activism in my opinion. Um, what do you see going forward in the next year or so? I think we're going to con- continue to make headway and uh, increase increase certainly the dialogue about liberty, individual liberty, and less government. One of the things uh, I'd like to see pass next year is uh, the repeal of civil asset forfeiture. Oh in the yeah, States. that's a big one. I sponsored a bill this year that was just a rehashing of a bill that was from two years ago, and it failed under Democratic leadership this year. But I think next year, with the House being controlled by the Republicans, we have a much better shot at seeing that succeed. And I know a lot of the free staters that get elected will be co-sponsors and will be uh, lobbying behind the scenes to make that happen. If we can get a a couple of liberty-friendly or small L libertarians elected to the state Senate, that will be a big help as well. So, for the for the listeners at home who aren't uh, like politics friendly, what's civil asset forfeiture? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Right now, the way it works is under the civil asset forfeiture laws, the cops or prosecutors can take your stuff. They can take personal property like your car, cash. Cash is very common. Jewelry, in some cases, your house, just by claiming that it was part of your um, criminal activity. Of course, it's always drugs that they use that for. So if somebody's uh, driving down with no drugs but has a lot of cash, they can say, oh, you're a drug dealer, we're taking that cash, we're seizing it, and we're taking the car. What's insidious about this is it's a civil uh, action. So even when nobody has been convicted, in some cases without even having been charged, the cops will just take your shit. And people aren't going to fight it, often because it costs more to hire lawyers to fight it in court than it does for the value of whatever that was seized. You know, let's say it was a couple couple thousand dollars worth. Well, in most cases, people aren't going to fight the big government for that. So it's really it's uh, a terrible practice. All the reason to use more Bitcoin because they can't steal Bitcoin very easily. Amen to that. Unless you, mm-hmm. have, unless you have them showing in your bag there at the airport security. <laughs> oh, yeah, it has some Bitcoin <laughs> pins that they think that are uh, Bitcoins. Bitcoins. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. A lot of people in the community who are a little bit more radical and, you know, very anti-police call them road pirates. And now when you call them, I mean – you have to explain that a little bit. Well, yeah, I see when they pull you over and they give you a speeding ticket or whatever, they're just really just taking your money, man. But now when it's like civil af- asset forfeiture, they literally just go and pillage you. They just stop you in here and take your shit and leave. And, I mean, these people are supposed to protect and serve us, and they're just literally road pot. You can't if, even defend what they're doing. They just come and take your shit first and leave. Off, even if you had pot, a bunch of pot or drugs in your car, so what? That's your property. You know where there was a bunch of ammo or guns and stuff like that? And if you had a couple uh, grand in cash, so what? So you're transporting money. Like, that shouldn't be a crime, and people shouldn't be stealing. Like, cops should not steal every, you know, dollar that you have on you just because you might be doing illegal activities. And those legal activities are nothing more than, you know, selling a product that people want. Now, in, even if you defend all the laws on the books, right, even if you defend that you're a criminal for smoking pot or having pot or selling pot or whatever, why do they get to just steal all your shit? It's like, well, you're a bad person, therefore everything you own is mine. It's like, what happens if your neighbor punches you in the face? Do you just get to own his house? I mean, that's just crazy. That's just theft. And, of course, the unintended consequence of this type of law 
is that it perverts the incentives for cops. So now they're looking for this sort of thing because they know they can just take it and people aren't going to fight back. One of the most egregious examples of it was a few years back in Tewksbury, Mass., just over the border, south of Massachusetts, where the— Let's the all say a silent prayer that we're, uh, of thanks to whatever superior being there might be that we're not living in Mass. Hmm. Amen. <laughs> uh, they, the, the feds seized this guy's hotel because out of five years and 20,000-some hotel stay nights, there were five instances of either prostitution or drug exchanges going on in his hotel or so the cops claim. But it came, the Institute for Justice, which is a great organization, IJ. Love IJ. I've worked for Clint before. He's they, a great guy. Yeah, they came to his rescue and, uh, and provided all the attorney free of charge. What they did is uh, they proved and got the cops to admit on the record in court that of all the other hotels around there, they chose this guy's hotel to go after under civil asset forfeiture because he had no mortgage. The, and because he wasn't a big national change that could fight. So basically he had all this equity. The motel was worth a million dollars. So the cops went after him because he couldn't fight and because it was a valuable asset that then they could turn around and sell it down the road and keep that money for their department. Wow. So what it, and that's what cops are doing. They're taking this stuff and they're selling off the fancy cars, the, the fancy jewelry and the cash, and lining the pockets of their own departments. Yeah, like I remember, like I, people like throw up memes all the time of like where it's like cop cars. Like this used to belong to like a drug dealer, now it's ours. Like no, you just stole a car from someone that was probably selling pot, you know. And then like right. just because, just because you you deem something that somebody's doing as you know immorally wrong doesn't give you the the moral high ground to actually steal from them as well. Yeah, and that makes up like even if you want to defend stealing a drug dealer's property, what you should do is sell it and give the money back to tax refunds to the taxpayers. But, yeah, no, no, well, it's another, not going to happen. Another example is a gal who was a, um, a stripper or exotic dancer, and she was traveling across the country with a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash in her suitcase. They pulled her over, they took her cash. And it turns out she had been filing her taxes correctly all along, and this was actually legitimately earned tips from her business. And, of course, the government had to do mea culpa, but not after years and years of legal battles. And they took her shit, and they took her money, and didn't give, give it back for a couple of years. At least she got it back. I mean, but most people never get that money yeah, back. Whatever's most left don't. after right. lawyer fees. That's right. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're about to hit uh, the end of the show, but I have one last question for you, Mark. When are you going to run for governor? <laughs> we'll save that for another show. <laughs> <laughs> you can make your announcement live on air. There's a fun book or a written by Davi Barker. Love I it. noticed on Joel's um, collar there, he has a pin on Bitcoins, Not Bombs. And Davi Barker is an excellent, uh, very creative artist and entrepreneur. And he's written a book um, sort of about New Hampshire and the Shire. And it's, it's, a, it's a children's book. But in there, he, there's a reference to Governor Warden. <laughs> which is a, I'm sure it's about you. I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah. All right, uh, so Joel, you, you got the you got the floor. It's your last episode, so go forth, right. sir. Oh. It is my last episode, unfortunately, fortunately, because you know that's one thing that happens. A lot of people around the world. I mean, you can talk to people. There's people who believe in the cause of liberty, and a lot of times they're just stuck where they are, living their lives, just bitching about how much the world sucks. And a lot of people come here. Not a lot, but a few. The brave few come here to try actually make a difference for the world and for the future. And unfortunately, the temptation is to take the easy path and just stay here. Now, be in a cooler place, but still just bitch about what's happening, not actually doing anything. And, I mean, uh, I think uh, Penn, Penn and Teller made this point about peace activism, about a lot of times people do activism that feels good, that they like to do, that makes them in their comfort zone. They just get to feel like they're good and making a difference and they don't so much care about exactly the impact of that now way back in my dc days i used to work for the leadership institute and morton blackball the head thereof one of his things he always said was you owe it to your philosophy to study how to win and so that's why i'm leaving my comfort zone and going on to greater things that i think you know there's plenty of people talking about what's going on here and that's wonderful because people need to know this is something for the world history books, what's happening here in New Hampshire right now. I want to have a more active role in giving people like the fine hosts of the Rebel Love Show 
stuff to talk about. So one of these things is, as you do, Mark, going into uh, politics, et cetera, going into the machine and slowing the, abuse, the abuses of the state. And then there's other people who actually who go out and start businesses and do things like that. Again, you're kind of, <laughs> you're kind of doing both of those. You're doing great for yourself. And so I want to be doing all that kind of stuff and also spread the message outside this little um, echo chamber of people who all just nod in agreement to go take these ideas outside of the people who are ready for them but not necessarily exposed yet. So I'm going to focus on stuff that challenges me a little bit more. And then I'll be on from the, sh the show from time to time just talk about all the awesome stuff that's happening. And we're going to win this thing. That's it. Liberty in our lifetime. Yep. That's all the of goal. Our lifetime. Yes, for everyone's lifetime. Good luck. We'll miss you. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, you can find all of our content at rebelloveshow.com. Uh, you can find my content at V Rebel. Joel, what's your uh, sites? TheDesertLinks.com. So everyone go check that out. Just go read his blog. It's good stuff. And, uh, oh, Shire Dude, where can people find you at? ShireDude.com. Whoa. Shire. And uh, of course, Mark, pimp your uh, your shit out your uh, your your business, the jingle. I can't sing it as well as Hanarchist, so I'll just tell you spoken word: porcupinerealestate.com. There you go. Go go buy some real estate from the the porcupine himself. Like I have money to buy a fucking house, man. Come on. Just well, you know, if they donate a bunch of Bitcoin, then we can buy a house from Mark here with Bitcoin and like yes. you know, give us give us like twenty Bitcoins and you know two hundred Bitcoins or something like that. Uh, one Bitcoin would be nice for me. One Bitcoin, we'll just wait five years. Come on, there you <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. All right, so we are out. Uh, so uh, peace, guys. Peace. 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 Bravo, gentlemen.